Welcome to the Paths to Understanding podcast. Um, today, we'll be sharing wisdom from our neighborhood with Allison Gill, the Vice President for Legal and Policy of American Atheists. Paths to Understanding's mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. One of the things that Paths to Understanding is we've been doing a lot of thinking about how we talk about our religious communities, faith traditions, and it really came down to realize that the term faith tradition doesn't really work. And so we did a lot of thinking about this. And what we came up with was the term wisdom tradition. And so what is a wisdom tradition? Well, it's a set of remembered stories, deep truths, probing questions, and a capacity for self-critique, exploring how human beings can live with meaning, community, and care for the earth. And then when we talk about a specific you know, community, we talk about a community of wisdom as a local expression of a wisdom tradition. So before we begin, we want to acknowledge that all of us here at Paths to Understanding are currently standing on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. And we honor with gratitude the land itself, the Coast Salish peoples, and their stewardship of this land. And we commit to working with them for a better, more just world. As American Atheist Vice President for Legal and Policy, Allison Gill manages the organization's federal and state advocacy for religious equality and litigation activities to protect the separation of religion and government. Allison is a nationally recognized expert on civil rights law and state advocacy. So Allison, welcome to Paths to Understanding. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so let me just get started by asking you about your vision uh, for the world. Like, what is that? And what do you hope for? And what kind of world do you hope to create? So just a small question then, right? Um, <laughs> just tiny. <laughs> well, you know, it's I, I, it's hard to create a vision for the entire world, but I would love to see a world that is more accepting, more peaceful, and more equal, if, if that makes sense. So a world where um, that meets the need, is focused on and meets the needs of people rather than, rather than the needs of power in terms of um, politicians, in terms of businesses, in terms of religion too, to be fair. Sure. So all that's more focused on community and, and people themselves and their needs. Well, amen. So there's there's so much there that I could resonate with and, and maybe we'll be able to talk more about all of that, you know, in, in coming conversations or, or today as we go along. You know, when I think about my own tradition, you know, I, I long for a world where, where life can thrive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think as well that um, the, the kind of Christianity that I'm, a part of it, it or it is is one in which we understand Jesus to be working against um, creating an alternative to uh, a society that's dominated by a few people. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so Jesus was attempting to to help uh, move us, you know, move his own century from kind of a pyramidal structure where there's you know a domination system with people on top and people in the middle, and most people are are poor and barely making it to a, a culture that's that's really organized around mutuality. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and uh, but and, and I, and I kind of like to think about that as like an open circle. So not a not a closed circle, but an open one. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I really resonate with with what you just what you just said there. And and I guess I wonder um, what are some of the experiences in your life that lead you to have that kind of passion or that kind of vision uh, for for your own work and for the world? Sure. Experiences in my life. I mean, I, I don't know how a person, well, it, it's clearly does happen, but how a person could exist in the world today, you know, especially after the last two or so years we've had and not see significant issues that, where there's a, a lack of equality, the lack of education, and sort of the self-interests of powerful people have so greatly impacted everyone around them and not feel a need to work, live in a more equal um, more pluralistic world. I, I yeah. think it's it's just so essential. It's almost self-evident. Uh, so <laughs> talking about my experiences seems a little bit, I don't know, unnecessary. But yes, I mean, we can. I, it's just so all around us. We can see how power is sort of taking advantage of the situation to sort of capitalize on on what has been happening. I think just this past year and a half of the pandemic, like the richest people in America, for example, <laughs> have uh, vastly increased their, their wealth while other people languish. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, there, there's many, many others. 
Um, so I don't know if you have like a more specific. <laughs> well, you know, so I, I guess I wonder from your own experience, like, was there a moment when you and your life experienced, you know, some some kind of 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 you know of not being fully recognized as a as a valuable human being, that like, because I know for myself, right, um, when I was a kid, um, I grew up in a small town of three hundred people. Um, my mom and dad went through a really terrible decade in the '60s. Um, mm -hmm. My mom and dad lost a farm through no fault of their own, really just mechanization was, was happening. I went through a bankruptcy after a fire in a small store. My mom was diagnosed with MS. My dad became the custodian at the high school. And, and in that social system, in that little domination system, you know, in, in my hometown, um, it was very clear that we had lost all social status. Yeah. And so, you know, I was bullied as a kid. And so, you know, when I started to see American Muslims getting bullied, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't like, I don't, I don't claim to have that experience, right? But I've been bullied enough to, to like have compassion for it. You know, so I guess I, I wonder, are there experiences you have that sort of give you, give you some fire in the belly, so to speak, give you passion for this? Absolutely, yeah, no, that makes sense. I, um, I had also faced bullying as a child. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm transgender. So um, when I was young, I grew up, I was fairly feminine, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, now I, I transitioned many years ago <laughs> and identify as female in my, my daily life. But when I was yeah. young, I, you know, was perceived in a certain way. And I did face bullying and harassment in school, mostly in middle school, some high school. Yeah. Um, so there was that. And, you know, as I got older and come to came to recognize myself more, I also found that there was a real lack of resources and information about people like me. And I was just, this was so long ago that, it, you know, nowadays there's resources, people, there's the internet. When I was young, there just wasn't. So it was really challenging um, just to find out more about other trans people about what it means, about living in the world. And I, I had a really, really difficult time growing up. Um, wow. I had a lot of suicidality, a lot of, um, you know, I, I was very closeted, um, which was, mm -hmm. has its own mental health challenges. So, of course. Um, so I didn't transition, I tried to transition in, I guess, college. And even then there was no resources. Like I, I would call to the, they didn't have LGBT centers in my day. Right. <laughs> so I called to the, um, Right. like the psychology department and asked if they knew anything and they couldn't even like we never heard of that so like even with that there was nothing so it was just like that sort of complete lack of information and mm -hmm. feeling so stigmatized and like an outsider i guess is where i drive a lot of passion yeah yeah and of course allison you know just just full disclosure i mean i i knew i was aware enough even though you know, we never really went anywhere because my, my mom had MS, so we just couldn't travel, right? Mm -hmm. But I knew once I could blow that popsicle stand, you know, kind of get out of my hometown, mm -hmm. I knew that I'd be a white male that would have a lot of opportunity, right? So even there, I knew like once graduation happened, like I was getting out of here, <laughs> you know, and that's that and that itself is, is, a, is a part of the, the, the privilege and oppression of our larger, of our larger culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I experienced enough of that. And, and also, I, I, I will say, like, a lot of my awareness about this, for, for, for me, came up through the intense study of the Christian scriptures, mm -hmm. in which I began to see Jesus as a nonviolent public leader, you know, trying to create a different way for human beings to live with each other, not based on in-groups and out-groups and hierarchies and, st and status-keeping systems, right? Um, and so that's where a lot of a lot of my passion comes through comes through as well. But I think that initial experience of of being otherized and and being on the outside and being bullied, I think, for a lot of people who work in kind of art these sorts of fields, right. uh, those kind of experiences are really really powerful. Um, and my first professional job, I guess, as you know, in, as in this field, as a civil rights sort of um, advocate was working at an organization called GLSEN, the Gay, the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network, focused on LGBTQ youth and stopping bullying. So yes. that was where I originally got started. And it was very similar to work that I had done or, or what I had experienced and able to sort of bring some resolution there. Yeah, so Allison, as you you know go about in your work, uh, I'm sure many times as people understand who you work for and what you do, some people have you know pretty intense physical and emotional reactions uh, to to the term atheist, and what are some of the 
the the weird kind of interesting assumptions uh, or false assumptions people have about atheism or atheists and and how do you respond to those absolutely yeah so atheists do still face quite a bit of stigma and there is a reaction often to the word atheist and what it means i i think it's very different in different areas of the country i live in washington dc where you know it doesn't really there's so many atheists it doesn't really matter that much it's sort of like any other identification uh, however, you know, and we have a lot of, we've done a lot of research on this topic, but places like Alabama, like Utah, Mississippi, uh, it, there's quite a, um, a large degree of stigmatization and discrimination that still occur against atheists and other non-religious people. And so false assumptions that I hear about and see sometimes uh, are that atheists are, um, for some kind of reason, people think they're Satanists, which I don't really understand. Uh, like there's some sort of equivalency there, Sure. Which, you know, obviously they're not, because uh, they don't they <laughs> deny any existence of, of Satan. But um, there are a number of others, like atheists have ill intentions, or that they are out to destroy religion, or you know that they're misunderstood. Other types of various misunderstandings. Um, so you know, I think there's a lot of assumptions about what atheism mean, atheism means in different places. Yeah. So what are, you know, so leaning into some of that, that research that y'all have done, if you're willing to talk about that, um, you know, so what are, what are some of the, of the, um, the reactions, uh, the sort of the, the unjust um, attitudes and actions and, and policies that you've experienced? What, what are, what are atheists experiencing in, across the country? Sure. And like I said, it, it, it is much more significant in very religious areas, but mm-hmm. atheists, we, our survey research shows that they face discrimination in, in many different areas, ranging from employment to housing to discrimination, uh, I'm sorry, to uh, healthcare. And it's interesting because in this country, we really lack data about different religious groups and the discrimination they face yeah. because yeah. our federal surveys don't collect data on this information. So other than things like hate crimes, yes. right, that's all we have. And certain wow. groups are very much more susceptible to hate crimes, particularly particularly uh, Muslim people and Jewish people. Those are yes. the two religious groups that face the most hate crimes. Atheists yep. don't face that many hate crimes. However, there is a large degree of stigmatization and discrimination and a lot of concealment as well. So people don't talk mm-hmm. about being atheists um, in their lives. They might hide it from their family, their friends at work. It's just not something right. that they discuss, even if they're feeling a lot of religious oppression or other people are discussing their beliefs, atheists often don't feel like they can do so, which has its own sort of self-stigmatizing effect. Right. But our research is entirely available at secularsurvey.org if, if you would like to see it. Would you say that, that website one more time for us? Sure, it's www.secularsurvey.org. Thank you. We'll try to put that in the link uh, uh, in the YouTube video for people to be able to go there. I mean, it occurs to me that part of the hate crime, uh, you know, statistic has to do with being publicly identifiable. Mm, that's true. Right. And, and so many times there's an atheist church in Seattle, for instance, which I hope to attend one of these days. But um, uh, but, you know, there, there doesn't tend to be large gatherings of atheists. They don't tend to wear the same the same clothes or whatever. We identified that way. But but the other other forms of discrimination are 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 also really important. You know, hate crimes, as you say, are not the only important form of of discrimination based on wisdom wisdom traditions. So absolutely, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, discrimination does not result in hate crimes, right? That's right, as, as, absolutely, <laughs> right. But it's still damaging and in so many ways to to people's capacity to work or or to live if it has happens to be in healthcare. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's very important. Well, thank you for that work, and we're going to check that out. And I, I hope to, to to learn more about about that. I was really disturbed, you know, to find out about the increasing uh, levels of hate crimes in the last five or six years. Um, you know, I think l- largely due to the rhetoric of some political candidates, particularly Donald Trump, um, um, who who I think was not so subtly encouraging violence toward those that people that people are fearful of or people have othered in some way. Um, so have, have you have you seen an increase in, in discrimination against atheists in the last four or five years? Well, I can't really speak to that because our survey was conducted in 2019. I see. And so uh, it's, not a, it's not a survey over time. So it's a one time, right. you know, picture in time uh, type survey. Yeah. However, I, I agree with you. Um, the sort of free reign that 
the last president gave to yes. discrimination to groups focused on hatred uh, to sort of be themselves is has had terrible negative consequences across our society, which I think are pretty self-evident, unfortunately, from January 6th and onward, because, you know, it's not stopping. That is true and sad. And uh, I think all of us have to do our part, you know, to try to counteract that and stand up for each other. Um, you know, so, so Allison, uh, I saw, you know, on your, on your website, um, what appeared to me to be a pretty, uh, the result of a pretty interesting discussion among atheists at American Atheists about whether to use the word atheism. And can you describe that conversation and, uh, and what you all mean by the term? Sure. So there's a lot of conversation we could have here. To be yes. <laughs> there's conversation within the community about what terms we should use for ourselves. Yes. And there's also conversation about like when an outsider asks, like, what is an atheist? Well, there's different ways to think about that too. Sure. Um, a lot of it is about sort of philosophical positioning, if that makes sense. I don't like to get into that because it's, I don't find it worthwhile. I'm not here to debate about the existence of religion. That's not my purpose. Yeah. But, um, uh, but there is sort of a philosophical, this is what atheist is, which is someone that does, uh, if, I'm, if I'm saying it correctly, someone that does not, uh, not sufficiently proven to that person that there is the existence of a God. So sure. that's sort of one framework. Another framework that I think is more realistic is someone who lives their life as if there were no God or, or religion. Mm -hmm. That means so someone who lives sure. their life without respecting or without acknowledging gods or religion. I, I like that better because it more captures reality. Um, right. And then there's within the community, like there's other types of words that people often use. For example, humanist is one and humanist is, it can have meaning in, within secularism and beyond it because you can be a Christian humanist, right? Sure. Someone who, you know, uh, appreciates humanity and like interactions, like elevates um, tolerance and, and other types of systems between people and basically fundamentally holds up other, other people. Um, and there's other words like skeptic, which are very popular and mm -hmm. free thinker. So our research on this um, showed that I think 95% of our 34,000 survey participants uh, identify to at least some extent as an atheist. And I think maybe about 60% said it was their primary identity. Mm -hmm. And after that, there was about 14% that said humanist. Mm -hmm. And below that, there were maybe uh, somewhere between 6 and 7% for other identifications. Right. So atheist is probably the most identifiable and the one that a lot of people sort of claim. However, others sort of cling tightly to different other identities. So I... I think, I think that, you know, and I think maybe some older uh, secular movement folks would despair to me, hear me say this, but I, I think we get caught up in the details too much on this and we should just say atheists and non-religious people and try to be as accepting as possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, you know, we face some of the same kind of issue with the term like interfaith or multi-faith. Mm, okay. Right. Because, um, you know, interfaith is a term that many people understand. Or multi-faith is a kind of a newer term um, that, that I think people can understand and, and they sort of can apply the word faith in a, a more generic kind of way, right? right. But, then the, but then the problem is that the word, the word faith um, is used within certain contexts, particularly in America, within kind of a, a larger sort of, uh, you know, Christian normativeness mm -hmm. that then, that then um, would, would deny um, the legitimacy of, of of non, uh, non, you know, God believing tr traditions. Right. right? And Absolutely. so how do we find a term? And then, but then within our own website, within our own organization, you know, we kind of have this, we have this term wisdom tradition, mm -hmm. which I think is a great term, like, but, but we also still have to use the term interfaith or multi-faith for people to understand kind of what we're trying to do. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I agree. Like, I think we can't worry about that too much. We live in it. We were born into a cultural environment. Like we have to surf with that a little bit sometimes. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have to do what we can. I have to say, though, I, I've never liked the sort of framework of people of faith and no faith. Oh, uh, I agree. I, I hear that all the time. I know yeah. it's are people trying to be respectful, but yeah. being sort of labeled people of no faith. I'm like, that's what is that? <laughs> 
<laughs> that's sort of just a strange formulation. I, I prefer non-religious people. It's nice and simple and it sort of gets the point across. But uh. Yeah, and of course, you know, that that sort of does get back to this to this idea of like what what religion is, which is, you know, we we could walk down this rabbit hole for a very long time, Allison, I think. You know, how do we define what a religion is? Are we talking about a historic you know, kind of wisdom tradition that exists over time. I mean, what, what are we talking about? I think, you know, from my perspective, and, and I think the perspective of many like Lutherans and Episcopalians and Methodists and, and you know, folk kind of sort of on the mid to progressive side of, of Protestant Christianity, like we would understand religion, like in a more general kind of way, like mm -hmm. the, the term came from Latin, which, which was religio, which was, is the same word we have for ligament. And what it's really talking about is the story that holds a society together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what I would argue today is that, is that, is that, you know, what we're talking about here, whether it's atheism or Christianity or Islam or Judaism, those are not the primary religion of our time, mm -hmm. right? The, the primary religion of our time is that we're producers and consumers in a free market winner take all economy. Capitalism. Capitalism. And if you win, you're good. And if you are poor, you're bad. Like, I think that's the religio of our time. And I think in Jesus' day, you know, Judaism wasn't the primary religion of the time. The primary religion of the time was the Roman Empire, like winner-take-all philosophy, right? And so he was trying to critique that. And that critique formed a community, which then, you know, has been passed down over time. And then, of course, obviously twisted and lost its way in many ways, right? Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, I think the further we go back in time, the more identical religion becomes to culture. You know what I mean? It, it's mm -hmm. like, if we're talking, you know, I mean, those are sort of pluralistic societies like ancient Rome, like it, it, they brought in people from all over, but, but, but prior to that, like even, you know, in, in Sumeria, like for example, like is right. there a difference between culture and religion? It's, it's integrated, right? So it's, it's really interesting to think about um, like what yeah. it means as you go further back in time. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I, I, I think that the other component of it is like my own, my own view of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were that they were really trying to critique um, the domination culture of the moment. So like in, in Egypt, there was the, the Pharaoh was the son of the God Ray, you know, mm -hmm. and so that was using this sort of, sort of theology to say that the way the world is, is the way the gods made it. So shut up and dig the ditch that you're ordered to dig. <laughs> exactly. You know? And so what I think Judaism was trying to do is to say, no, wait a minute. Uh, there's, there's one creator who made human beings, you know, uh, as, as beautiful, you know, children of God. And so therefore you have to see the humanity of every person. And this unjust system not only sucks practically, but it isn't inevitably necessary. <laughs> it is not baked into the universe, right? But then, of course, all of those, and I think Christianity and Islam started much the same way. Like, we don't have to live like this. Right. It is not inevitable that we live in this kind of exploitative society. But yet we also know that those traditions can themselves very easily lose their way and get co-opted by the powerful. And then, and then again become a tool, right, um, for, for maintaining st unjust status quos. So I mean, I think that we would definitely point to that. I, I think that's one of the main major critiques that, that non-religious people have on, sure. on sort of those dominant religions is that's exactly uh, what happens. Sure. Um, sure. It's interesting too. I want to just bring up one other point and that's, you know, I guess it's around this idea of the nuns or these ideas. This, what we're seeing today is not just like religious people and non-religious people. We're seeing a large group of people that are religiously unaffiliated. Yes. And sometimes those people are sort of grouped in with non-religious people, but I, I actually think they are distinct. Mm -hmm. Like when we did our research, it was about people that are affirmatively non-religious as yes. opposed to this large category of nuns, which can have all sorts of like, I think 60% say they believe in some form of, of deity and some high percent says they believe the religion is important to them. How can you say that and still be like an atheist? It doesn't make any sense, right? So yeah. I, I just find that interesting it's such a, I, I mean, you talked about sort of connection before. It was such a disaggregated group of people. And what does that mean for society currently, even though they still have religious interests? Yeah, boy, it is, it is so complicated, um, Allison. And I, um, 
So look, I, when I'm on the street, I'm, I'm in a Black Lives Matter protest or something else. I mean, I have great conversations with all kinds of folk, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I I have a lot of experience with with sort of those re those religious but unaffiliated folk, right? You know, and and I think um, my question my, my question to all of them is this, right? And I don't care if I'm talking to a a Christian, a Muslim, a Jewish person, an atheist, a secular humanist, whatever, uh, a nun, like, I, I don't care what the tradition is. What This is the question I ask, is how has your tradition, whatever it is, mm -hmm. led you to risk your status, your, you know, to engage in some kind of risk to uh, love your neighbor, your neighborhood, and yourself, like to build a better world. Like how has your tradition called you beyond like the immediate needs of the day mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to work for the common good? Like that's what I want to know. And so when I go into a church, like that's ultimately the question I'm asking people. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't almost care less what you believe unless what you believe leads you to that kind of love and risk for your neighbor. And conversely, like if I'm talking to an atheist on the street and, and boy, those conversations are not always pretty, by the way, you know, but that's OK, because they've had pain. Like, I understand that, that this caller, when they see that, they are seeing all the oppression they've experienced. Like, I, I get that. But I say them the same thing, usually after I apologize for whatever oppression they've experienced. Right. Is how has your tradition, your deep philosophy, your deep beliefs called you to risk to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And that really is what I'm interested in. And, and, and so, you know, religion can be critiqued. You know, I think Christianity can be critiqued for that, but Christianity also carries a strong thread of encouragement to do that. Yes. True. And so it's, it's not a simple thing of religion is great. It's, it has a batting average, mm -hmm. right? It's not a simple matter of, of being a, a non-religious person is, is great and therefore you have solved all your pro all the problems of the world right absolutely i mean like you were saying religion it can become co-opted to support powers sure. you know the the powerful and there's plenty of non-religious people uh that are also uh, i mean we could just look at the i don't know the the alt-right for example and most Indeed. of them were non-religious folks who were giant supporters of the last administration and all the inequities that entailed so i yes i don't know you can't just yeah, no, I, 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 I think I know where you're going. And I was, I was going to bring that up too, that like, you know, part of it is like, you know, George Gallup famously said that religion in the United States is a mile wide and an inch deep. Mm. Well, sometimes it's not even that deep. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the folk that stand up and want to talk about, you know, Christianity, well, if you ask them what it real, what they mean by it, they, they cannot answer anything. All that it's, all it is for them is a, a word for whatever in-group they think is fully human and as opposed to the outgroups, they think that aren't. It's also Christian nationalism, I think, which is sort of an ideology that Christianity is part of being an American, right? Yeah. So it's about this American form of religious tribalism. It's it's very yes. interesting. There's been a, a quite a, a lot of really great research on this. I, I finished a book by uh, Catherine Stewart called The Power Worshippers on this. I don't know if you can take a look at that, but it's it's really interesting about how this sort of Christian nationalist movement goes and grows and why it was supported yes. by those who are in power to sort of shore up their, their basis of power. It's, it's really fascinating. Of course. And, and you need to know, like I, I'm, I have done classes at a church uh, south of where I live a little bit, and they're currently doing a, 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 a series of classes on Christian nationalism. Mm. And, and of course, uh, within the Lutheran tradition, we have a, uh, this kind of our, one of our patron saints, you know, he's, he wasn't perfect himself, right? You know, that's, that's kind of a, a code language for us, for a person that we admire who did some good stuff, right? Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. who was really part of a movement to look at, at national socialism and the way that it was using religious kinds of sensibilities and gut instincts in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. to help support the Nazi reign. And, and, uh, and there were thousands of people in Germany who, on the basis of their deep um, study of, of the Christian tradition said no to national socialism. But there were many times more people who said, well, it sort of feels the same and it's us and it's powerful and they're gonna give us more food, so who cares, right? Mm 
Yeah. And some of those same dynamics, I think, are happening today. All right. So I'm going to ask you the difficult question now. Please. You talked please. about batting averages. Yeah. Um, in Germany, it was many times more were supportive. In America, oh, yeah. many times more are. Uh, I mean, I think you, it's easily easily be possible to look at the uh, the media and, and where you know where Christianity and people stand to see that yeah. many times more are sort of not pluralistic as opposed to yes. being pluralistic in terms of their religious beliefs. So yeah. I mean, well, so the, it's right. Should we... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is so I, I think the batting average today in terms of people being willing to stand up for uh, for the notion of, of pluralism, for the notion of right of rights, civil rights, um, for people who are from uh, from wisdom traditions that are not their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Which, again, uh, for our listeners, I include atheism as a wisdom tradition. Um, I think the batting average is better than it was in Germany. Uh, but somewhere around like 45% of Lutherans like did not vote for Donald Trump in 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that, uh, that there are, but there is a kind of sorting happening, right? So when I first came out with Neighbors in Faith in 20, uh, 2015, 2016, our bishop would get regular letters from people saying that they would no longer be, be part of a church that supported a person that was advocating for Muslims. Yeah. And, but the difference was, is that our bishop and, and at that time, Kirby Yuntai was willing to write them a nice letter in return and say that he disagreed with their, with their assumption. And that he, just as Jesus stood with the Samaritan, Jesus would stand with the Muslim or we, we, we should stand with the Muslims today. Mm -hmm. And so the reality was, is that, is that there was enough leadership and some learning from the mistakes in Germany within the Lutheran tradition to say, we don't want to walk down that road again, which is, which is why I think a tradition is, is a good thing. Like when we are willing to, to hold art to our ideals and then critique ourselves for the ways in which we have fallen and we are falling short, mm -hmm. I think it can be a helpful thing as a, as a kind of rigor that it can bring. Um, but it can very easily become some become a tool of something else. But then, like you said, so can nothing like a belief in nothing a nihilism that we have today, which is as long as it gives me more power and gives me a better entree into some kind of uh, economic, you know, livelihood. I don't really care what happens. Yeah, that's that's not good either. <laughs> no, and I, I, I wouldn't say that atheism is a belief in nothing, but I would say that that sort of self driven, you know, will to power is very much what we're seeing uh, all throughout our society today. Um, indeed, indeed. Uh, I was, there's a recent book put out by Ryan Burge, who is a sort of statistician. Uh, he's he's uh, really great. We've had him speak on a number of topics, but it focuses on the nuns like we were talking about. And his, one of his conclusions is that in this country over a period of decades, what's happened is that religion has sort of purged itself more and more of moderates and liberals so that more so percentage wise, it's more so the conservatives that remain. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that, you know, and I understand that, you know, um, when I was young, we attended mostly Presbyterian and Methodist sort of mainline churches. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more familiar with that and Lutheranism, yeah. but it also, I mean, has declined quite, quite a lot in this country. Is that, is that right? Well, so look, I mean, I think all of this is shifting. So we have to understand that the whole conversation around Christianity has to be framed in terms of, of, of colonialism mm -hmm. and the doctrines of discovery and the, the, the distortion of, of, of Christian tradition uh, for white supremacy. So we have to understand that that there's that, that that's a lot of it. So what I tell people in my own community is that as soon as our as soon as our our, our grandparents or great grandparents landed on this continent, mm -hmm. they downloaded white Christian supremacy into their catechism. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is continue to do work to disentangle that, to recognize that, and, and reform constantly be reforming ourselves, uh, you know, to deal with that. And so I think that um, that much of the decline of mainline Christians has sort of like moderated. Um, and in fact, the, the increase in evangelicals and fundamentalists in the country has also significantly hit a wall. Interesting. Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, so the, the, the studies now are, and this has been true for five or six years or, or more, that um, evangelical and fundamentalist Christian kids, mm -hmm. only one out of seven goes back to church when they leave their household. I have seen that. Yeah. You know, so I, I think there was a, for a while, there was this kind of like runaway freight train thing that said, well, all Christianity is going to be evangelical at some point or fundamentalist. And that's not, that's not happening, partly because people are becoming aware of the toxic, um, the toxicity of, of, of Christian supremacy, white Christian supremacy, and the, 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 the toxicity of supremacy as a whole, because it's destroying, we're, we're destroying each other, and we're destroying our planet as we go. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting time. So how can we stake out, you know, the core of our tradition in a way that doesn't, that, 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 that lifts up these values, but doesn't deny the value of human beings who don't agree with us, right? Yeah, yeah the <laughs> and, real pluralism, right? Yeah, it's that's right. Interesting too, because you're, um, you know, the example you're giving, how like was one out of seven returns to church and it, it also explains why we see such a focus among these evangelical communities on young people. Like yes. there is um, all across the country, there are laws being proposed to introduce the Bibles into, into uh. schools in you know, putting up God we trust on every classroom wall. That is legitimately the law in some states that they need to have God we trust in every, every classroom. We're just seeing this wave of that across the country. And it seems to me like this desperate sort of thing to see if we can get young people to remain in their, in their tradition. And I, I, I don't think it'll be successful, but symbolism has power, right? And it's, it's interesting where that is the focus uh, of that movement currently uh, is to try to hold on to their demographics. Well, we, there's a lot of folks that wanna make America great the way it was, again, <laughs> in, their, in their view and for their benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is, there is tremendous grief out there. Um, and I think, um, so when, when I've done, I've done something like 300 speeches and across the state and across the country. And a lot of times I'm speaking in smaller towns to more conservative audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do is to build on some common shared values and, and help, and help, you know, reframe for people. Like we're not, you know, rights are not about something about which we have to, we have to, um, uh, the best way for me to, to, to strengthen my rights is to strengthen the rights of people who are different from me. Right. They're not zero sum, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, 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 we sometimes compete about them, like how they should be lived out in the society, you know, but, um, but it, it's, there is a sense of loss and nostalgia and it's, it's particularly difficult amongst the traditions that lifted up a strong kind of end times, you know, Jesus is coming soon to destroy a world near you sort of viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And because the future is kind of closed down for them. Um, and so there's a lot of work, you know, among, you know, my, my community to sort of push back on that and say, hey, look, no, we're in this for the long term. You know, the, the, the scripture tells us to care for the, the entire planet, mm -hmm. you know, to tend the garden. And we better, you know, and that's what we need to be doing and, and loving our neighbor, <laughs> including the neighbor that, that believes or thinks or dresses or speaks differently, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. And it hits on environmentalism too, to a large extent, which is another sort of topic brought up by this, um, I don't know this competing view, I guess, within Christianity of these issues. Um, yeah. So, so what are some of the values? So we spoke about values a second ago, you know, and I, I know that, that it's a really diverse world. Atheism It's a very diverse, mm -hmm. you know, community, but you know, what are some of the, the values that the atheists typically will share? Sure. Um, well, I think um, I can't speak for all atheists, of course, that's what you just said, yeah. but uh, many atheists are very interested in science and science-based reasoning. Um, they mm -hmm. sort of see themselves as science-informed cursed people. And then that's not always the case, but that's how they often see themselves. Yeah. And are very interested in like uh, having an objective scientific point of view about different aspects of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, they are, I would say, um, you know, I think there's an interest in being um, sort of liberal in the not political sense, but like in the openness sense, like tolerant and accepting of other people. I think there's a lot of interest in that. Yeah. Um, fighting for, among our constituents especially, really important is religious equality, mm -hmm. which is the, the principle that one's religious beliefs should neither advantage nor disadvantage a person before the government. 
So no one should get special rights or be restricted in their rights by the government because of their religious beliefs. So yeah. that's that's really like a key. Uh, I don't want to say tenant, but it's a key a key principle of, uh, of of American atheists and many of our constituents. Yeah, I really really appreciate that. And um, you know, the from a just just so you know, I wrote a master's thesis. Don't don't bother reading it, but on the the relationship of science and religion. When I was in seminary, and we had an actual an actual center that brought scientists and and top level theologians <laughs> together to talk about stuff, and and so I I but I but when I was in high school, my 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 pastor said to me or said to us in sermon, he said, well, uh, he was really angry about this like publication that came out from the from the Lutheran Church, and he said, if evolution is true, we should go vi- we should close the church and go visit our relatives in the zoo. And that was fine for the farmers who went out, you know, and and uh, and drove the tractor the next day. But I had to go back to science class, mm-hmm. and that created a real cognitive split for me for a while. And so I was able to finally put that together, you know, back together again in seminary, thanks to my to my leadership of this of Phil Hefner, my professor, and um, you know, so I, I went to the country too. I mean, still, mm-hmm. children are still taught that, you know, I, unfortunately, I mean, that's one of the things that we and other groups work on is that they're still being misinformed about creationism in school. Yeah. And I think, you know, creationism from my perspective is a, is a toxic uh, thing to, to teach. Uh, it should just should not be taught at all in public schools. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's just no, no way. Um, yeah. I don't know how you, yeah, it, it's a religious concept. I mean, courts have made that clear. So, and like you said, I mean, evolution is the fundamental it's, it's, it's like the key, of fun, and it's essential to understand modern biology. You have to understand evolution because that's, right. everything flows from it. <laughs> so right. I, I think it's, uh, I actually have a biochemistry degree. So it's something I've always was interested in, even though now I, I went to law school and I work in civil rights. It's always right. been a passion of mine. Well, it's, it's also a significant misunderstanding of, of, of religion, of Christianity and Judaism, for instance, mm-hmm. because like the first story in Genesis, I mean, the, the Hebrew people did, they, they push back on domination system systems by telling stories. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so the first story in Genesis uh, was not a scientific description of exactly, you know, in what order things were made. Like, that's not what that is. It's actually taking a, a, a story for the Babylonians told mm-hmm. about the creation that made in which human beings were conceived of or were created to be slaves. Mm-hmm. And so it was a counter narrative to that slave sort of uh, sort of storyline that the Babylonians were telling. And so it was really a story as resistance, much as you might find uh, Negro spirituals out in the out in the cotton fields were resistance to the, 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 the slave holding mentality that was at work among them. That's interesting. So it's a counter narrative where they're directly imbued with their own self-worth by, by yeah, that makes, that makes sense as far as story. Absolutely. But then of course, you know, what happens is that the, as, as that story is preserved, mm-hmm. it's understanding of its original context changes and people, you know, use it for all kinds of the same old reasons that they use any, any, any tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, we always talked about, um, we, we always, I always talk about how creationism is a misuse of both science and religion um, in a way to really support authoritarianism and a Christian nationalism or authoritarianism. Well, those are three really, really, you know, so scientific reasoning, sort of liberal democracy, you know, kind of kinds of notions of, of human rights. And then of course, religious equality, you know, so let, let me just ask you a, a you know a less of a legal question and more of like how we live together in the world kind of a question. I didn't okay. and I didn't write this down for, for you. We'll we'll get on to the rest of it. But so I'm thinking about my small town, you know, 300 people, you know, most of the folk attend either the Catholic Church, or the Methodist Church, or the Lutheran Church. You know, if you go out of town, you know, there's there's people that are that are um non-religious, you know, folk there as well. So if if the mayor, if the city city, you know, wants to put up a, some Christmas lights, you know, uh, a Christmas, uh, you know, kind of themed thing in the town square, like, how do you feel about that? Okay, so yeah, you know, we um, we oppose it organizationally because we're talking about favoring a certain religion. I, I, I'm sorry, you said Christmas lights. You didn't say a specific dis- like. If so you let me let me let me make it more 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 clear. Let's some yeah. kind of like Christmas display, you know. So it'll okay. be like it yeah. won't be like Santa Claus and and Rudolph the Red nosed Reindeer. You know, it'll be like Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and and the baby Jesus. Let's say they want to do that. 
So I would say that we don't love that it exists at all funded by the government. And I'll make an argument against that. But yeah. if it is funded by the government, then it should at least be open to lots of, it should at least be pluralistic, right? Yeah. If it's open. Right. So that's, I think the latter part is sort of where we are as far, as far as the law is currently, um, where, you know, if, if they have these displays, they should at least be pluralistic. We would say that the government, you know, uh, should not be, well, I mean, this is, uh, it's a Madisonian principle. The government should not be taking money from individuals to support the religious beliefs of others. That is inherently tyrannical. And therefore, if there are, I mean, not, there are non-religious people in this town because they're everywhere, even if you guys don't know they exist, right? Absolutely. You don't and, allow them to be, to be named, right? You know? Exactly. Yeah. So they shouldn't be taking money from those people and use, using that to support specific religious beliefs of other groups. And that's sort of a, like I said, it's a, it's a, a principle that James Madison really elaborated upon. And it, it has really interesting, actually religious in some ways, roots, uh, that whole sort of uh, mm-hmm. based on a person's uh, connection to their own relationship with their creator. Yeah. But I, I still think it's a very sound principle in terms of uh, establishing religious equality as well. So, I mean, you can respect the idea from different different angles. Right. right. You know, I think what, what folk are kind of worried about is, is there is there a way for us so, so what, what, what people hear in that really is all no's like, no, you can't do this. And no, you can't do that. Uh, I think a lot of times they don't hear the, the positive part uh, of, of that claim, right? Because what we want to do is build a society in which people are genuinely and practically, not only legally, but practically capable of, of, of worshiping or not worshiping of, of being religious or not religious as they, as they feel uh, it, it will best lead to their happiness, right? Um, yeah. uh, but, I, but I also think sometimes that, that um, you know, part of the fear, uh, and, and it's not so much amongst Lutherans, although there, there is a little bit of it, I think in some parts of the country, but there's a, a feeling like, um, like the part of the United States that has a, a Christian, uh, perspective is not going to be allowed to be acknowledged in public. Yeah. So, so what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, I, if, 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 if it weren't for the fundamentalists wanting to push it on everybody, it'd be a whole lot less problematic. <laughs> I don't think, I think that maybe not everyone, but like 99.9% of, you know, habitations in this country have a church. <laughs> You know what I mean? They exist in some places in every corner. Right. I don't think we are realistically in a world where religion is hid away. Mm-hmm. Um, and the government is supposed to represent everybody, not just particular factions, not, or even if they're the most powerful faction, they're supposed to represent everybody. So I would contest that this idea that just because the government isn't saying something, then it doesn't exist in society is, is sort of a false conclusion because... Atheists would never object to the church putting up a nativity scene. Like, right. never. Right. Like, that's their right. They have every right to do so. So I, I feel like if we can respect people's rights to do that themselves, and, like, we have... The only way we can have religious freedom in this country is if the government is a neutral arbiter, if they don't take a specific role. As soon as they start taking a position, somebody's losing religious freedom, um, unfortunately. And that's, that. you know... It could be the majority, unlike, which is unlikely. It's more likely to be the minorities and the non-religious people. So that, that's why we, we, we really fight on this issue. And I'll also say, I know, it's, I know it sounds like I'm saying no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, if you think about where we are as a country and yeah. the diverse religious pluralism we currently have and how religious America is compared to a lot of, let's say, Western dem- uh, democracies. Sure. Right? Right. That is a direct result of this uniquely American principle of separation of religion and government. Right. Um, because we have the government staying out of it and the church it's being its own sort of disconnected sphere, that has allowed religion to thrive in this country in a different way, as opposed to, to, to Europe, where religion, you know, was more dominant and there was sort of over time, it's really drastically faded. Um, so I think if we look at it that way, we can see that although it sounds like I'm saying no, I'm actually saying yes, just use your own resources for it, right? But yes. I don't know if that makes sense. 
Well, I think it does. I think it actually does. And, and it, it really helps me to get more, more clear about it too. You know, because part of the, of the, of the, the separation of church and state that, that is sort of in, in the non-establishment, part of that is, so, is to protect religion Absolutely. from the, 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 the power of the government mm -hmm. to use it as a tool to justify oppression, right? So um, the fact is, I don't really want governmental powers coming in and, and using uh, my, my tradition uh, to be able to further its ends. Like, I really don't want that. Um, and I, and I, but I think we're, we're in this country, we've, we've had a, a, a long, long history of Christianity perhaps not, not being you know, directly used by politicians, even though that does happen, but of kind of like willingly you, you, uh, supporting an unjust system of Christian white supremacy, right? Um, and and I, I would say that that is the primary driver for people moving away from religious tradition because they've seen the, 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 the deadly, toxic uh, reality that that's created. I think it's a driver. I, I have no idea if it's the, the primary driver. I, I definitely agree with you, though, that this sort of connection between, I mean, if you ask someone who they came to this country and asked, like, if they're not familiar at all with Christianity, and they were exposed to media for a year and asked, what is Christianity about? Well, they would say it's about hatred of certain types sure. of people. That's okay. what it's about. Yeah. And, you know, that's from, a, I'm not a Christian. From a Christian, from a true Christian perspective, that must be disgusting. That must be horrible. I mean, I would think, right? Because that's like the exact opposite of what the religion sees itself as being about. So I, well, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that is, a, is always a challenging point. I mean, I love journalists. Journal we need journalism, right? We desperately yeah. need journalism. Um, but we also have a, a situation where, um, you know, human beings respond more negative, more powerfully to fears or to fear what's fearful or what's a threat mm -hmm. than we do to what is good and positive. That's true. Yeah. And so to get the eyeballs, you got to talk about the threat and we've seen that with respect to Muslims, uh, you know, uh, only 5% of news coverage, you know, up to like 2013 was positive right. around Muslims and the rest was defamatory uh, it, and, or at least negative. And, and, but it's the same thing. We don't hear about the nuns, you know, feeding all kinds of folk in an inner city neighborhood who are just who, who, who risk their, who just risk everything, you know, to be out there loving people. We don't hear about that. We hear about the bad stuff uh, about Roman Catholics. We hear the bad stuff about the Lutherans. We hear the bad stuff about the atheists. We're only hearing the bad stuff about each other all the time. Right. No, you're not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that, that, that doesn't mean that there isn't bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do need journalists to talk about it. It's just, I wish that we had more openness in our, in our hearts to the positive of each other, you know, too. But I would also say there's, you know, leaders of like some of these movements are, they're not being reported on by the media. Well, they are, but you know, they're themselves saying, this is what, this is what our, you know, it commands us to sort of do these things, which are hating LGBT people. And of course. To right. I mean, that is, you can't, deny, I mean, even if we're agree oh. that the media does focus on negative things, that is a really significant factor. In this oh, I, I, I totally agree. And yet, you know, in the Lutheran church, like for instance, in 2009, you know, we, 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 we finally, after a long struggle and, and um, I mean, just very challenging debates, um, you know, welcomed LGBTQIA plus pastors. Yeah. Interesting. And, uh, and so, you know, and there was, and, and, you know, what we heard in the media was that, you know, we're giving up on Christianity, real Christianity. We don't believe in anything anymore, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and we did have some people leave, mm -hmm. uh, but uh but actually, it's been a tremendous opportunity for us to go back and rethink, you know, what is it that we're really about? What is the core of this Abrahamic tradition and the Christian version of it that, that was really important to us? And so it's, it's, been, it's been really great. And we still have a lot more learning to do. Do you think it's that we'll see a resurgence of if the evangelical sort of um, population has, as you said, sort of plateaued? Do you think we will see any sort of revitalization of the mainline types of streams like you're talking about, like Lutheranism and others? I think we're seeing the beginning of it. Um, 
and, and, and what I, I want to be clear, like what I don't mean is that we're going to see like mainline, everybody become mainline Christians and we're going to like be, you know, but, but I think if we talk about, about vitality, mm-hmm. we do see um, sort of a revitalization of, of, of many congregations, but of course those congregations are faced with the same, with the same kind of uh, polarizing kind of dynamics, the rest of the culture does, Mm -hmm. you know? And so when, uh, when, when clergy, when, when pastors begin to talk about race, uh, begin to talk about uh, LGBTQIA rights or, or whatever else, those same polarizing factors are at work in their congregations and they have to slowly, they have to slowly tend that conversation uh, until, until there's enough people in the community that understand what's at stake, that then the community kind of, kind of shift toward a more public role, um, a more public uh, facing uh, stance about, about those issues. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I do see revitalization taking place precisely in the congregations that are willing to have those conversations and stick with it over the long term. And then because the greatest sin of our, of our groups is passivity. Hmm. We can think all kinds of things in Sunday school class. Well, who cares? Again, back to the question is how are you risking yourself to make, to make work for the common good? And to me, that's, that's the issue of faith. Like that's the faith of Jesus is he's going to risk himself for the common good. Well, are you, or do you just want to sit back and say some nice things about him? Right. Because I don't think he could care less if you say nice things about him. (laughs) (laughs) But it it is a challenging environment. So, so Allison, I just want to say like, I, I, I would hope to have more conversations with you or other folk in your, in your organization. And I, I guess, um, you know, what are some examples of atheists working you know, to, to create a better world. I, I would love to hear, to close with a couple of stories. Sure. So um, American Atheists, we have, I think, over 225 or 250 affiliate groups around the country. And these are small, you know, atheist, skeptic, free thought groups. Mm-hmm. And we provide, you know, uh, resources, you know, we help them organize and provide materials about how they can engage in their sort of activities. And one of the things we recommend is doing services. So, doing the sort of uh, feeding the homeless, going out there and trying to, uh, especially during the pandemic, there was groups that, for example, created, um, there was a drastic need for a while for hand sanitizer. So there was there were groups in Texas, for example, that worked on creating hand sanitizer. Um, there were groups that focused on around the election, getting out, getting out the vote and helping group folks get the polls that they needed to, to go vote. So these are all, I mean, there's probably too many that for me to be able to mention, <laughs> but there, it's a core aspect of a lot of uh, non-religious groups are focusing on that type of service. Um, and it's something that we encourage along with things like advocacy and also just community building um, and social events. So we try to say, tell to groups that you're, it, you're doing best if you can do a variety of different types of activities to bring in yeah. different types of people that would be interested in forming this community. But, you know, it's interesting. I think community, from our research, it shows that how important it is. From our national survey I mentioned, I think about 20% of people were involved with local groups. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I can tell you right now the percentage that says that folks that said they were, had engaged in service activities. It was about um, volunteer activities. So about 10% of the 34,000 people said that they had done some with their local groups in the past. So that's you know, a good, good percentage. But um, I sort of lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you're talking about community and how important community oh, is. Oh, thank you. Yes. So community, the, um, about 20, I think 22% were involved in, or 20% were involved in community. And, you know, we saw uh, after looking at discrimination, the negative impact that discrimination has on people and stigmatization has on non-religious people. Yes. We found that those who are involved in communities, there's a really positive impact and they're much yes. less at risk for things like depression yes. and isolation because they have this community around them. And, you know, like we know that religion serves that purpose for a lot of folks and we think sure. it's pretty important for non-religious groups for that reason to have 
uh, to serve a similar type of purpose, to be there, be, to be a, a community that people can engage with. And I think this is one of the ways that we can help that. Yeah. So in the, in, so our, our sort of methodology is, 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 you know, it's okay. It's a good thing to learn more about another wisdom tradition. Like that's a good thing. Hmm. It's much more powerful when we get to know someone from that wisdom tradition. Like that is just exponentially like more powerful. And then it's even more powerful than that when we work together for the common good. So when in a local community, folk get together. And um, because again, those, those, all of those become, they, they sort of help us form a larger we, a larger sense of a larger group. You know, yes, so we are Christians maybe, or we're, 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 we're atheists or we're agnostics or we're, we're Jewish or we're Muslim, but we're part of a larger group we larger collective that's that has that has shared values and is working for the common good here locally right. and and I, I really look forward to connecting with the local group here you know in the in western washington and and helping to get them involved in some of in some of those kinds of activities because when people see american muslims working for the common good it really shifts their imagination absolutely and those stories get shared and and the same i think uh, happens when people see see athe the athe atheist community being a part of that th those community building activities, and we 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 want to be in 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 conversation with them and and be in partnership with them in doing that because I don't like as a Christian person I don't I don't think it's um, it's incumbent on me on me to see the worth and value and dignity of every human being. Mm -hmm. It's not up to me to apply some kind of theology test to them first. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So Allison, I, I so appreciate this conversation today and, and, and the humor and fun that we had in doing it. I look forward to more uh, conversations with you and, and with the, the local groups here. We, we want to thank all of you for listening to the Past to Understanding podcast. You can find more at pasttounderstanding.org. Um, our podcasts are all on major podcasting services and on our YouTube channel. And until we see you next time, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbor.